The last of the turtle fish was named Fastis. <laughs> what is this? Fastish colon. No way. <laughs> Fastisha Callon. There you go. <laughs> Beautiful yeah. pronunciation, Dave. Be- <laughs> Thank you very much. But uh, yeah, Fastish colon. <laughs> 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 Hello everyone and welcome back to the Council of Elrond where we discuss all things Lord of the Rings and today we are going to be discussing all the creatures, good and evil, in Tolkien's Legendarium. So don't forget to leave a like, a review and obviously guys don't forget to check us out on YouTube too because um, we're starting anew there and we need some more subscribers, come on! Uh, (laughs) All the links are in the description below. I am Dave and I'm joined by my wonderful co-host Jonathan. Hello there. (laughs) <laughs> Hello there. Hello there. General Kenobi. Um, all right, so let's begin. But first of all, it must be said, as Middle Earth and Arda are basically reflections of our own world in so many ways, many of our own animals exist in Tolkien's world too, such as Fish, birds, reptiles, all that kind of stuff. But um, on today's episode, we'll be solely discussing creature, like weird creatures, ones that are specific to Tolkien and and some famous animals too. So um, mm. yeah, so uh, well, I'm not going to get into the whole history of each creature and you know talk about every oh, single. Th- <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to talk about every single little fact there is, but like I will let you know if uh, I will let you know if they were slain uh, and by whom. And maybe one or two fun facts along the way as well. So um, let us begin. What, what shall we? What shall we begin with? Um, let's go with uh, let's go with evil creatures first, um, and then we'll we'll talk about the good ones and and there's some Sounds in betweens good. as well. Yeah. So of course, not all of these creatures are inherently evil, but uh, they may have been corrupted, or they've just done some evil deeds, or or else they're just kind of like you know bad guys. So um, let's begin with our first creature. Giants. So Jonathan. 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 That's when I lose weight, I become Jonathan. <laughs> uh yeah, so gi- giants. That's what you are right now because you haven't lost weight. So where do we where do we see these giants or where do we know them from? Um well just regular giants or like stone giants or Yeah, well I guess they they are one and the same, but where do we mm. see see them? Where do we see them? Well, we see some visuals of them in the Hobbit movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, are they? Do they make the regular edition, or are they only in the extended cut? I can't remember. Oh, I, I, I have a feeling that it's the. Ex- no, I think they're in the regular. I think I saw them in the cinema. I don't think so. I don't remember <laughs> now. Uh, yeah, so we do get to see anyway some Peter Jackson's adaptation of uh, what these stone giants are, and I'll have to say I. Didn't love it. Uh, it wasn't my favorite part of the movie. I thought it was just a bit weird. I thought it was just... I mean, it was kind of cool, I suppose. Uh, but it was just a bit kind of crazy. And it felt a bit um, like Marvel-y. Uh, like Marvel, like the MCU kind of. It felt a bit like that. Uh, or that like was just Transformers. Throwing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe that's more along... Yeah, like... Yeah, Autobots or Optimus Prime, kind of this kind of huge thing that was rock and stone and wasn't very mobile, didn't really feel like a living creature. It was a bit weird. Now, I mean, that's just Jackson's vision of what this uh, these stone giants would be like, I suppose. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. What was your opinion about them? I, I'm trying to make up my mind. I haven't really ever thought about I, this too much before. I think when I first saw The Hobbit, I didn't love it either, but. Um... I, like the the fact that it's it's kind of similar to in the book how they kind of talk about giants and they have to like escape the giant uh, they have to escape into the caves and the giants are throw, throwing rocks at each other and I don't know maybe maybe some people just thought that it was all not a euphemism but kind of a metaphor or something like they, they're you know it's yeah a big yeah just storm like that they felt outside that maybe they weren't actually you know giants like what we saw in Peter Jackson's where they're as tall as mountains maybe they were just large men. That were like yeah. Orient size or something, and they were just throwing rocks. They're like the rock giants, and it's just because they were normal humans but throwing rocks. I, I don't know. Maybe it's uh, maybe 
I thought it was kind of cool though, and I liked how they weren't they weren't so obvious. It wasn't like you know a big face with an eye opening up. It was just kind of like m- almost mountains taking a slightly humanoid figure and just kind of crashing off each other. And I liked how it was done during the storm as well. And every time yeah. there was you know lightning bolt, a giant would like move around and. Thought that was kind of cool, but um, I think it's always what, cool when you're using some sort of special effects like that to do it at night in rain or something like that, like where it's not. If it's like such, if it's done in like a bright light, day, like you know, daylight scene or something, mm. you'll always see the flaws, and you'll always it'll always look less real. Whereas you know, your imagination is so much more powerful than any sort of CGI. So it's always better to do those kind of scenes, like with the Balrog and things like that, just like things that are like in, you know covered with shadows mm. and darkness and. You're using more like, oh, what could be there rather than what you can obviously see is there. So it's obviously, it's always uh, in filming, uh, it's always a better technique to use that, to use the kind of the darkness and let your imagination fill in the blanks. So it's good. I mean, if you're going to do any sort of a scene with these giant rock monsters, that's probably the way to do it at nighttime uh, in the middle of a storm where you're like, what? oh, did that just, what was that? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Like, oh, it was probably that. Yeah, yeah. So um, good take. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Like it's all kind of imagination, and it falls into that whole thing of uncanny valley, where especially if you see something like Transformers shot during the daytime, you can see everything, and it just doesn't look real to you. Even if the special effects are flawless, it just doesn't doesn't look real because nothing's hiding this uncanny thing that your mind has never seen before, and you're like, that just doesn't make sense to me. But when things mm. are in the shadows, it's it's easier. But um, yeah, moving on. Uh, well, well, first let's actually talk about what Tolkien's thoughts of the giants were. He mentions, uh, well, giants are actually mentioned as creatures mainly in the early Legendarium, written by a young J.R.R. Tolkien. So there are some drafts, or there are some early drafts of the Lord of the Rings where it mentions giants, but they they were later removed. So their only definite appearance is in the book The Hobbit. Uh, so other than that, they are notably. No, they notably never appear anywhere else among cr- creatures and races of Arda, and they do not participate in any of the wars. So they're also not corrupted by Sauron, of course, as well. Mm-hmm. So this causes people to believe that their one mention in The Hobbit is a relic to Tolkien's earlier phase of this of his legendarium. So it's kind of like he, he already brought out the book and then he might have gone away from the thoughts of giants. And there, it, it's... Yeah. It, they, they, they do mention giants a good few times like i looked up um the hobbit book and i did the whole you know search f thing and went through the pdf and i think there's like 18 mentions of giants but, really yeah when you brought when you brought up giants as the first uh like creature that we're going to discuss i mean creature giants sounds a bit weird to call it a creature but mm. i was like oh it's a bit of a bit of a curveball here because i was like mm. i haven't read the hobbit in in yeah, so long I, I mean i <laughs> Every now and again, I'm like, I'm going to read The Hobbit. And I just like get sidetracked by something else or by a different book or whatever. So um, it's yeah. kind of hard to, but, but I definitely should go back and read it again. But there, for like for reasons like this, I'm like kind of going, scratching my head thinking, what was it that Tolkien actually said about Hobbits? Or Hobbits, about a, a giants. I was, I was kind of struggling to remember. So I'm interested now to hear what you're going to tell me. Oh no, that's basically it. <laughs> oh, that's it. All no, right. Well, like, loads more. Oh, that, whole, that whole scene that we see in The Hobbit uh, film where they're like trying to evade the giants and get into the cave that all pretty much happens in the book as well where they talk about stone giants throwing rocks at each other Gandalf mentions how he he doesn't have much love for the giants or you know he doesn't have much love for staying around while the giants are about and they want to get into the caves and all this kind of stuff but um, mm. apart from apart from the hobbit there is one mention in the return of the king book when Minith, Mi, uh, Minith, Minas Tirith Minith. is described, <laughs> Minith Tirith, it's like, uh, <laughs> Biggest, biggest. <laughs> yeah. Mike, Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson, yeah. Minith oh, Tirith. About Monty, Monty Python, when he's like, oh, yeah. uh, Biggest, uh, Biggest. The, Or the, the emperor has a lisp, yeah, yeah. He had a wife, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to know right. her name? Uh, so Minas Tirith is described as, quote, seems to have been not builded but carven by giants out of the bones of the earth. Now, this is suggested, uh, or sorry, it's suggested that this notion derives from old English mythology in which giants were often portrayed as builders of ancient structures. So it might have just been a way to talk about really good craftsmen. So not really giants, but you know, Tolkien talks about things. Is that Tolkien's like, is that a normal word back then? Or was that Tolkien's way of saying like built? Builded. Builded. I, I like it, you know, I'm just like, oh, cool. Or was that yeah, just... Yeah, but like, 
I yeah, I thought the exact same thing when I was writing it down, but it doesn't have a little blue squiggly line under it here in my notes. So therefore, <laughs> it must be a word. Yeah, it must be a word. It must um, be a word. Strange. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that is the end of giants. Tolkien knew all the words. Okay, so let's well, get he knew all the words. Tolkien helped write the dictionary, literally hmm. or figuratively. Well, no, literally. Literally, <laughs> he did. He worked on the W's. Yeah, he worked on other things too. He worked on. He used the word Hobbit. Yeah, yeah. He invented a couple added. of words, but uh, but then he was worked on the W's. He, was, he worked on the W's. Uh, like I think Walrus was a uh, mm-hmm. uh, Walrus was one was one that he did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There yeah, you go. Very yeah. good. <laughs> so um, let's uh, move on to the next creature, which we have uh, dragons. So. We discuss dragons in another podcast, so if you really want to go check that out, you'll hear an in-depth description of all the main ones. Dragons are also known as great worms, so um, yeah, we're not going to get into the nitty-gritty detail and talk about the stories of everyone, but Johnny, just uh, what, what famous dragons do we have, or what what ones do we know about? Uh, well, the most famous one would probably be Smaug, again, mm-hmm. from the, the Hobbit book. Uh, do you want more? Yeah, sure. Give us Give us... Two or three. Uh, we have uh, Ancalagon the Black. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very good. Who would be the biggest and baddest dragon that there ever was. Huge. We have um, Glaurung, who was the first and the father of dragons. Yes, well done. Um, do you want some more? I know, that that's pretty good. Yeah, you've mentioned okay. Glaurung, the father of dragons. He's the, the first dragon. and The great he appears- one. He had no wings, yeah. He had no wings, but he could breathe fire. fire. No, could he? Mm. Yeah. yeah, he could. Yeah, he could. Yeah. And he could also... See people with his eyes and stop them in their tracks. Gee, he could yeah. kind of like put them under a spell, yeah, mm. and he could like wipe your mind clear, and yeah, he could basically just um, uh, kind of freeze you. I don't know, freeze you, but kind of like he <laughs> make, make you. you kind of. You <laughs> <he> could touch <laughs> your soul. <laughs> How about the power to move you? <laughs> yeah, he could really like a uh, kind of. Put you under some sort of like a hallucinogenic spell or something, kind yeah. of like a hypnotist or something. He and was kind like, of talk to you and get in your mind and all that pure Galadriel style. Kind um, of like the snake from the Jungle Book. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit like this. He's a great worm. <laughs> <laughs> so Glaurung appears at the Dagger Bragalock in the First Age. And ultimately he is slain by Turin Turumbar. And we've... Do you want to just say that word or do you want to tell what, <clears throat> or listen, what the Dagger Bragalock was? The Dagger Bragalock was a battle, a big battley war. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I think if I heard that those two words like a couple of years ago, I'd be like, "What the hell is that?" But I suppose now that you hear it so often, you kind of forget. And Turin yeah. Durumber is a is a human, is a man as well. He's a human <laughs> man. <laughs> so Smog, yeah. as well as mentioned, he's known from the Hobbit. He took over Erebor and was eventually slain by whom? Uh, by Bard the Bowman. Exactly, in the Third Age. And you also mentioned Ancalagon the Black. He fought in the War of Wrath, which is a war. <laughs> uh, yeah. A wrathful war. And this was in the First Age, and he was eventually slain by Eärendil. Um, so I'll just mention two other dragons that we have. There's Scatha, which is a, another lovely worm. He was slain by Fram, the Northman, in the Third Age. And we have the Beast of Gondolin, or aka, also known as the Fire Drake of Gondolin. He battled there during its fall in the First Age and possibly died there, but it's unknown. But probably. He probably died there. <laughs> now, there are many dragons uh, that have appeared in Tolkien's writing. And heck, there was even a, a war called the War of the Dwarves and Dragons, but we've just mentioned the most notable ones i think there's also cold drakes and serpents which are similar to dragons but may differ in some minor ways like not having wings or not being able to breathe fire or mm. there's also the, the the like watery ones and we see that in the rings of power as well the what do they call it do they call it the worm or they the call s- it a worm i think yeah 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 they which call is, it a worm in that yeah which is pretty good cool, so yeah, yeah, I, I but yeah. So as you mentioned there as well, the, the the cold drakes specifically are the ones that were non fire breathing. So um, mm. I suppose it makes sense. Cold yeah, which is they've got no fire. But it is weird. Fire in their bellies. Doesn't Drake mean fire in rapper Latin or something? I mean, uh, <laughs> the rapper. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what? Does, well, like, sorry, I stop, I've stopped listening. Uh, no, I, does I think Drake, Drake mean. I don't know. I think it's got something to do with fire. Like, I know fire drake is often what you'd call those, like, fire-breathing 
creatures. Um, like dragons. Yeah, but surely be... Drake is the like dragon thing, like dra- like fire dragon or true. Fire yeah, Drake, but yeah. there is like a a distinguishable difference between dragons, drakes, serpents, and all that. But I have no idea. Sh- I'm not your yeah. man. <laughs> you are my man. <laughs> Anyways, okay, uh, I'll be sticking your man. sticking to something similar. We're gonna keep on the reptilian um, phase here. We got. Uh, Fell beasts. So, Johnny, what what the hell are fell beasts, and what is the difference between them and dragons? Oh, uh, uh, I don't know. Me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know what the what the what the hell is a fell beast. Um, I, I like your little hell and fell rhyme there. Uh, <laughs> just for people that aren't sure what the fell beasts are, they are the uh, creatures that the Nazgul ride in the when we see them in the. They're, do we see them in the second movie? Yeah, they're in the second them? movie when Gollum and Frodo and Sam are hiding in in those little yeah, oh, they, lands. That's, that's the first right. time we see That's true, yeah. The first time. Yeah, when he says, do you want to give us a bit of Gollum saying wraiths on wings? Is that what he says? Yeah. I don't remember. <laughs> I've got such a sore throat today, but oh, I'll right, try okay, it. Never mind. Wraiths! Wraiths <laughs> <laughs> on wings! <laughs> that's pretty good. Uh, yeah, that's when... When uh, yeah, when Frodo was like covering his ears mm, and holding yeah. his his stab wound and all this, and there, uh, and that's when is it? Sam says, "I thought we, we I thought they, I thought they died or something." Like that. And then God's like, "No, no you no. can't kill those. You cannot kill them." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he says, "Rates." He's like, "Rates, rates on wings or whatever," and yeah. he's like, "That's." And then we zoom out. We see the the ring rates flying along on these uh, dragon-like creatures, which are called fell beasts. Well, the difference is between them and dragons, I don't, I, I'm assuming the fell beasts don't breathe fire. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's the difference. They just have, they look like they have a different shit, like they have like long necks as well. They kind of look, I don't know, like a Brachiosaurus or something with a, <laughs> with with wings or something. I don't know. Yeah. You know, they've got those kind of like long necks. Brachiosaurus and like tiny... that just drank some Red Bull. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so they look like they've got these like long necks and tiny heads. Now again, I'm not. I don't know much about the fell beasts. I don't know if that's the the way that like Tolkien described them. I can't remember their how they were described in the books, but they, but maybe they just said they were more like dragons. So I can't remember if the design came from Peter Jackson's mind or if that was uh, what they were described to look like. Well, a little bit because I'm, I'm going sure to talk about enlighten me. I, I'm, I'm going to talk about one difference that Peter Jackson may have changed, or it was his own vision again. Uh, first of all, let's just talk about the word "fell." In this sense, is an archaic English word meaning dreadful or terrible. So, hmm. "fell beasts." Sure. Um, other names would include uh, hell hawks and Nazgul birds. So that's also what they were known by. Class. And yes, like you said, these were the steed of the Nazgul when they wanted to travel by the skies. And their origin isn't really known, but they are presumed to be from an older time, an older age, and possibly bred and corrupted by Sauron. Uh, they are described as attacking with beaks and claws. So that's one thing that I think is mm. a noticeable different. I, I would imagine they're more bird-like than dragon-like in the face anyways. In, in Peter Jackson, they have kind of a... Uh, how would you describe their kind of wide smiley jaw jaw yeah but um yeah it's more of a mam- mammal kind of jaw rather yeah than a, a bird like a, a beak so definitely not a beak yeah yeah it's definitely I, not I a beak yeah but like the way it's described is a beak in the book um we know that eowyn slays the witch king's fell beast at the battle of Pelennor fields uh in the chapter the great river in fellowship of the ring on the river anduin near san uh, saren gebir Legolas shoots down a fell beast in the night as it approaches the, the fellowship. So that's two fell beasts that we know that die in the books. And in the Return of the King book, chapter six, the Battle of the Pelennor Fields, Tolkien describes the fell beast as follows. Quote, It was a winged creature, if bird, then greater than all birds. And it was naked, and neither quill nor feather did it bear. And its vast pinions were as webs of hide between horned fingers, and it stank. A creature of an older world, maybe it was. So there you go. Schmelly. Schmelly creatures they were. Stinky birds. Um, <laughs> angry birds. Uh, yeah, so well, it was it was interesting because when you said oh, it, was, it had a beak and maybe it's more bird, like I was immediately like, kind of going, oh, I wonder then it have feathers. But there, it's clearly mm. said it was naked. So it had, uh, what did it say? No feathers and no... Yeah, neither no quill skin. nor feather did it bear. And it said neither, it was naked. <laughs> neither quill nor feather. So it yeah. wasn't going around 
Using right quills to write, write letters. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Neither quill nor feathers. Uh, interesting. Very, very good. So, um, what is the quill? Is the quill like the, the stem part of the feather? Maybe, yeah. I, I thought the whole thing was the quill. Like the, the pen and the feather part. But must be wrong. Mm. But like, that's what they call it. Like I know in Harry Potter, that's what they, they call their pens, like a, a quill. So Yeah, I suppose. But you would be like, I'm going to write with a feather. Um, <laughs> that Maybe. would make sense. I, yeah, I know. I just thought that when you use a, a feather as a pen, it becomes a quill. It's just the new name. Yeah. I don't know. But it told you that it had neither quill nor feather. So maybe they're just the two nor parts. Nor pen. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> nor Tolkien. Um, yeah. So I don't know. Uh, interesting. Cool. Um, so yeah. And what else? Did, that, that was quite like, I mean, there was a couple of words in there. Pure Tolkien. I'm like, I have no idea what he said. Like, uh, we, but he had like webbed feet P- as well. Or p- pinions were as webs of pinions. hide between horned fingers. So I think Peter Jackson got that pretty right in his. Like they 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 do have like claws almost. Yeah, and you can see there are like webbed claws, and they use that. You can imagine they yeah. walk around on them and scratch away. I just want to point out as well. It's it's interesting in the Silmarillion, uh, Valaquenta of the Valor. It says that Arome is a hunter of quote monsters, monsters and fell beasts. Now, this doesn't, this probably doesn't mean the actual fell beast, but it's probably just a word used to describe various just like evil creatures. Beasts which are fell, like, yeah, uh, meaning yeah. that are kind of evil or. Meaning whatever. dreadful and terrible, I suppose. <laughs> by dreadful, the... and ter- dreadful and terrible beasts in general. And these ones are just, that's the right, that's our name. We are the <laughs> dreadful and terrible beasts. It's like, okay, right. You can't um, even get a and, good fell beast. That would suck. No. Um, yeah, pretty stinky as well. That's good to know. Yeah, they're stank. I mean, Anyways, I, I know. I never would have assumed that they were like beautiful smelling animals, but no. just just to clear that up as well, in case anybody <laughs> was wondering, they smelly. They stank. So the next uh, creature we have is the Watcher in the Water. And we've mm. discussed this in detail before, but but Johnny, just for anyone who doesn't know what I'm talking about or what creature, can you please describe it to them? Well, we see, uh, we see him on the big screen in the Fellowship of the Ring, just outside Moria uh, at the doors of Durin. When the fellowship are trying to get in and Gandalf's trying to remember the password, we see that um, the watcher attacks because um, mm. the hobbits disturb the water. But do you remember who actually disturbs the water in the book? Oh, you've, so you've asked me this so many times in the podcast and I always forget. It's, it's um, Baromir. He's yes, throwing in the rocks. Good. He throws at least a rock, I believe, a rock, in the water. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's sulking. For, yeah, uh, he's, yeah. He's, so he throws a rock in a and uh, disturbs the waters. And then the big giant octopusy kind of creature that comes out is what's called the Watcher in the Water. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so Here this is... Um, so we, we don't know much about the, the Watcher in the Water, uh, but it is slain by the Fellowship, probably, or maybe not, we don't know. Um, but it could be one of the nameless it's wounded, things that for sure. It's definitely wounded. It could be one of the nameless things that Gandalf mentions, possibly. Mm. Um, it's common for the Watcher in the Water to be depicted as the Kraken-like creature that we see in Peter Jackson's creation, because well, that was probably the first time it was depicted on screen. So you often see that in in video games and I don't know models and such. But it should be noted that the, that Tolkien never actually described the creature's physical attributes aside from the tentacles. Um, and I think, mm. I think in the movie they could only they could only do like twelve tentacles, but I think it's described as having around twenty one or twenty two or something. Really, they could only do twelve. I think yeah, like I think not so. not from like a rights position or something, was it? No, 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 no. It was something Just to do with they could only it. Was do. the rendering? It took way too long to render more than sure you and I know all about rendering stuff now. <laughs> so imagine like trying to double up the amount of tentacles, and they're like, ah, this is taking oh, way too long. God. But um, but yeah, please check out our episode titled The Scariest Creatures in Middle-Earth. And there we break down what the nameless things could be and how the Watcher could be one of them as well. There's a few fan theories and we'll, we'll I think we go into that in that episode. And if not, you can go check mm-hmm. out those theories for yourself because there are some good ones. So um, let's move swiftly along to another... another Taylor Swiftly. <laughs> another kind of hobbity creature that we see in one of the movies. So, werewormes or wereworms. So, Johnny, um, what do you know about the, the worms? Where have you seen them before? Are these the big, like, earth-eating mm. things? Exactly. Um, 
Yeah, again, uh, I remember them from the Hobbit movie and I don't remember them really from the book because it's just been so long since I remember it. So I don't know if they're similar in that way or I, I think they probably were. They were just, were they just big giant worms that just like at the ground and create these huge like holes and stuff. Is it the same as in they are in the movie? Well, in yeah, in, in the in the film, they're so we see them in way. the battle of the five armies. Yeah, correct. Uh, that that is an extended of... scene, I believe. That de- that definitely is an extended scene. You see, I, in the normal, it is definitely because in the normal one, you just see the the legions of orcs are coming out of tunnels. But then, in the extended one, I think, well, I'm pretty sure it's an extended. No, I don't think so. I don't think so because I, I don't think I've ever seen the extended version, and uh, I've definitely seen them in that. Right. I've I don't think I have never watched the extended versions of any of the, the Hobbit movies, but I have seen the the like one of those we, we did an Behind episode the on the, the the Cardinal Cut episode. Oh yeah, yeah. Which was the had a couple uh, like of fa- a fan edit where he took like the best parts of all three movies and mm. made it into two movies. And some of the scenes I was like, I've never seen this before, and I realized, oh, he's obviously including lots of extended scenes. So yeah, because the only the- time I've seen any of the extended scenes, I think. Uh, maybe I've seen the first one, the extended one. Uh, one of the extended but... scenes that he includes in the Cardinal Cut, I remember, is a good chat between Elrond and Bilbo in Rivendell, which um, I don't know why they cut yeah. it, but yeah. No, the, like I mean, I've never watched the full movie. I think maybe I've seen the first one, the extended one, but the second yeah. and third, I've definitely never seen those extended uh, movies entirely. But I have seen lots of the like deleted scenes from the extended yeah. ones on like YouTube and stuff. Just like, oh, here's. Gandalf like meeting Thrain or something like that like or um mm-hmm. he meets Thrain isn't it yeah he meets Thrain yeah that's yeah, a whole like, like or Thor yeah Thrain. plot of the <laughs> movie that oh is it? no it's Thor it's not Thor it's not Thor no no it's Thrain it's Thrain yeah that's Thorin's father it's Thrain and then Thrain's Thorin, father son of Thrain son of Thor yeah <clears throat> yeah so it yeah um like we do see them in the Hobbit the Battle of the Five Armies and. I, I kind of thought their appearance was quite cool at the time. They are described, you, you got it perfectly, in the film they're described as Earth Eaters and they aren't used for fighting in any way, just for tunnelling to allow the transport of Azog's just Legion of Orcs. Jump on the ground. Exactly. And it's pretty cool how they do it. They like bite out and then they, they have like a piece of earth in the ground. They're like poof, crushing it in their teeth. But did you know that there is only one mention of them in all of Tolkien's writings? And mm. it is actually Bilbo. Bilbo says in The Hobbit, An Unexpected Party, quote, Tell me what you want done, and I will try it. If I have to walk from here to the east of east and fight the wild weirworms in the last desert. So that is the only time we ever hear them. And mm. it isn't known if they truly are real creatures or if they're just part of Hobbit folklore. Like other creatures, uh, we know that in, in Hobbit folklore, cool. we get um, creatures called Dumbledores which are not uh, old professors in Hogwarts. They're giant bees. And we get Hummer horns, which are a legendary race of winged insects. And we also get turtlefish. Turtlefish are a legendary race of giant sea monsters, sea monsters mentioned only in Hobbit verse. And the last, uh, sorry, the last of the turtlefish was named Fastis, <laughs> what is this? Fastish colon. No way. <laughs> Fastisha Callon. There you go. <laughs> Beautiful yep. pronunciation, Dave. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you very much. But uh, yeah, Ask I... Tish Colon. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, I was going to say, I really like that Peter Jackson used this ambiguity of whether we're, wereworms were real or not. And he just kind of made a canon and he didn't like overuse them in the film. They're, they just kind of pop up and then say goodbye. And it's an interesting take. <laughs> he doesn't He doesn't use them in part of the battle. They're just part of like, yeah, but I remember watching them and be like, how is this happening? How are the orcs controlling <laughs> these worms and telling them where to, okay, go. Now, guys, open up that little hole and let us march through. It's a bit ah, too... Ah, uh, But no, what I think is stupid <laughs> is how, like, how the worms, like, burst out of these tunnels and they're eating the ground and then they suck they away. Come back. And, then, and then immediately the immediately, orcs Immediately, yeah, out. yeah, yeah. You're like, wait, that a worm is obviously enormous. Surely it would take ages for it to get out of the way or... It would have to come out completely in order, like where mm. was the army? Just yeah, I I understand as well. I I agree with you there. I I just mentioned there as well, Dumbledores, uh, which are giant bees, and we actually do get a glimpse of giant bees at Bayorn's house. Um, 
So mm. these these could be Dumbledores. Um, I think that's just a nice little nod. I didn't know that at the time when I watched The Hobbit. And, you know, you see these giant bees. And I think, uh, especially The Hobbit, you kind of feel like, ah, oh, well, sure, anything could be big and magical. But no, I think T- Tolkien was quite specific about what creatures exist and what ones didn't. So it would be weird to just see, like, you know, a ginormous butterfly or something. But yeah, it makes sense to see big bees. Um, mm. Interesting. And I just want to say as well that the word where, like W-E-R-E, comes from the Ger- Germanic term that refers to male humans. So do with that what you will. I don't know how that applies to, to these So werewolves worms. would be like human wolves. Yeah. Human male wolves. Yeah, that like makes more wolf, sense. Basically. I don't know why right. these are called were- werewolves, but... And again... Bilbo so mentioned, cool, I think. he mentioned them once. So maybe in Tolkien's mind, they were actually tiny little worms that turned into men. But Peter Jackson's version, they're just giant earth eating worms. But anyways, um, we need to move swiftly along because there's lots more creatures to get into. So let's right. move on to the, Keep sp- coming. the spiders of Middle Earth. So these mm. were mostly found in Mirkwood and would grow to huge sizes. Now, the cinder name for spider would be Ungol, which makes sense. Why? Because the mother of all spiders was Ungoliant. Exactly. It's the mother of Shelob. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was just going to say, and the daughter of Ungoliant is, and you got it right there, Shelob. So most of these giant Mirkwood spiders are the offspring of Shelob and from then um, Ungoliant as well. Now, Tolkien may not have been concerned with the differences between spiders and insects, as he describes Shelob as having insect eyes and compound eyes. And he also describes them as... Quote, hunting and spinning insects in the Hobbit book. Spiders also, they shed their skin and Shelob is described as having a hide, quote, ever thickened from within with layer on layer of evil growth. So there you go. I don't know how much Tolkien knows about um, about spiders because he seemed to mix them up with insects, but pff, who cares? Um, <laughs> Ungoliant was slain by herself. H- how does this happen, Johnny? Um, she got really hungry and she ate herself. <laughs> yeah, you're bang on. She she consumed herself in the darkness. I believe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I feel like that sometimes after you know a Saturday night. Yeah. I just want to consume myself. I'm, just, in the well, I'm like, just my figure looks delicious. I can <laughs> go. <laughs> and Shelob uh, scurried away and may still be alive to this day. So, Dan, I just wanted to ask you as well: How does Shelob incapacitate Frodo Baggins? She stabs him in the neck with her stinger. Exactly, with with her stinger. Now, stingers are common for some insects to have, but not for normal spiders. And I just want to, I just want to read to you here. Oh, sorry, I don't have the actual letter. But in the letter, one sixty three, Tolkien talked about his experience being bitten by a tarantula. Now, I can't remember what episode we talked about this in, but we talked about it before. How Tolkien may have been inspired by this experience where he was bitten by a tranche as as a child i think he was only like four or five in south south Mm. africa but i think in this letter he basically talks about how that's just kind of utter nonsense he doesn't traumatize him or something yeah well that's what people suggest you know people trying to find allegory oh and he's saying his letter that no well he he said like look maybe that's the case but i don't remember this incident at all but um But in this letter, he uses the verb sting in the rare sense of a spider's bite. So thus, all his references to Shelob's stinging may actually be biting. So there you go. Hmm. I don't think there is actually a men- mention of Shelob's stinger. Now, I didn't look that up. But the fact that I did look this up makes me think that I should have looked <laughs> up the word stinger in um, the Return of the King book. But I'm, I don't think so. I'm pretty sure. But yeah, these are, again, yeah. These, these are just mythical creatures. So I'm sure a giant spider having a stinger is like, a big deal. Yeah, no, I, I'm, it's not going to affect me that much. No. Um, like, I'm not cool, uh, right? someone who, what's the name of the person who studies spiders? Um, An arachnatologist? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Some some Iraq, Iraq something. Some people out there beside Iran in Iraq. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but are there breeds of spiders that have stingers or do they all have? Do they all bite you? Do you I, know that information? I think most of them bite you. There might be like one or two um, from that'll the stick you. That yeah, that will stick you. I don't know. There's always got to be a weird one out there, right? Mm, got some spiders around there carrying their shivs, and they're like, "I want to shiv you." 
Yeah, so moving on from spiders, we have vampires now. I have very little to say about vampires mm-hmm. because the only vampire we know by name is Thuringwithil. And vampires were mysterious bat-like creatures in the service of Morgoth and Sauron. Um, just before I say anything else, Johnny, do you know anything anywhere else where there's a mention of a vampire? Well, we know that... Um... We know that Sauron shapeshifts at one point into a bat and he flies away. Yeah. He's away, away <laughs> when he's uh, fighting. <laughs> uh, he's fighting Luthien and uh, Huan the Hound. Well, he's exactly. fighting the Hound, I suppose, Luan. Uh, Luan. Uh, Luthien's <laughs> Hound, Huan. And he fights him as a werewolf and then he fights him as he turns into like a snake and then he turns into a bat and all this kind of stuff. So he, he legs it as a bat. So that's probably, you would assume, someone human form turned into a bat. That'd be vampire. Uh, kind yeah. Of that's exactly did right. He, did he? Did he? Did he? Did, I'm trying to remember. Did they mention the word vampire in that scene in, in that process, or is it just yeah. that he turns into a bat? No, they say, say they say vampire. I think. Um, pretty like sure. Va- vampire bat or something like that. Yeah. I I think they just say vampire, and vampires are described as being bat-like creatures. Um, okay. But that was just the wording of Tolkien. He just used vampire, and um, he didn't turn into the Count from Sesame Street or something. Like that. <laughs> I want to <laughs> suck your blood. Yeah. Um, One, two. <laughs> Three, <laughs> whatever, uh, Silmarils. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I always imagine that scene as well where Sauron just turns into, well, obviously he's the ha- he's the wolf at first, or the werewolf, and then he's like turning into so many different other creatures. I just imagine he's being like choked and he's like, do you know, Mystique from X-Men and when she's being choked and she just starts like transforming into loads of different uh, like yeah, colors yeah, yeah, and yeah. people. <laughs> And he's just like turning into all these creatures. Eventually, he gets to like you know a winged creature, and he flies away. But yeah, that's yeah. a. I was getting more of that image of um, the genie when he's turning uh, yeah. Abu into. He's like, mm, no, no, that's not quite right. He's like tur- turns him into a car, turns him into a like bicycle. And yeah. He's like, Wait, I got it. Or like a camel. A and camel. Finally, he's like yeah, an elephant. Yeah. So. Just changing forms the whole time. So anyway, yeah, yeah. Well, that's all we really know about vampires in Tolkien's Legendarium. So moving on, we've already touched on it a little bit here. Werewolves. So werewolves were wolves inhabited by dreadful spirits that Sauron had imprisoned in their bodies. Johnny, can you think of any famous werewolves? We already mentioned one, kind of. You just did. Well, I mentioned the one of when Sauron became a werewolf. Exactly. Yeah. Um, other ones, um, well, we know that Finrod is killed by some werewolves. Um, yeah, that's true, actually. They're not and, named, I don't think. Or maybe they are. No, I, I don't so, believe so. Yeah, there's, but, there's, two, yeah. there's two main ones. Uh, there might be more, but there's two main ones, and I don't really expect you to remember their names, because you'd remember them when I tell you them. But, um, yeah. Will I tell you them? <laughs> you, you go ahead. You okay. Should, you so because I, I can't I can't remember them now. Yeah, we have Dragluin and his son Karkaroth. Do you remember Karkaroth? Yeah. We, we talked about it in yeah. episode four. Yeah. Oh, okay. The confusion yeah, so like about the... him being fed uh, Morgoth's actual hand and flesh from his hand. I think you were actually yeah. right. It's he's just fed flesh. Of course, I was right. He wasn't just eating Morgoth's hand. Yeah, but it wasn't <laughs> very <laughs> obvious. It was like he f- fed him flesh off his own hand or something. The wording was weird. The word I was believe he said like flesh from his hand or something. I believe it was the preposition from, not flesh of his hand. Well, fresh, flesh know. from his hand still works. I thought it was the flesh from his hand. <laughs> I'll give you some food from my fridge. Does that mean that you're going to eat my fridge? Or are you going to eat the food from Oh, my but fridge? if I said I'll give you some cake from my cake, then it's like it could be the <laughs> same cake or it could be a cake on the cake, but flesh from the hand. The hand has flesh what on it. Maybe I'll give you some cake from my cake. That was a big case. Well, the hand has flesh. The, the fridge doesn't have cake like in built into it. Look, you're 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 digging a hole. Anyways. Um so what um <laughs> Which one is the one that eats the the Silmaril then? Eats the hand of uh, Karakroth. Beren. Karakroth, Karakroth is Karakroth. the one, yeah. Um, so, but they, they were father and son. Dragluin was the father. So you tell, yeah, you tell the story there. Ah, uh, do I have a story? They were both giant and terrible wolves in the first age that served Morgoth. And yeah, I mentioned we kind of talked about them before. So check out that episode again. Scariest Creatures in Middle Earth. It's a good one. It might mm. be way back in the archives. But, um, yeah, um, the story, I can't really remember the story. Karkaroth has the, he eats the Silmaril and it's inside his belly. And I think he eats Baron's hand as well. 
and then basically yeah. there's a fight with Huan, but we'll get into that a bit later because Huan's one of the good creatures we'll discuss. So Yeah, but one of the cool things, again, yeah. I, I can't remember all the details, but I remember that um basically Baron had kind of made a deal that he would he would definitely reclaim one of the Silmarils or he would go and whatever. And mm. he co- he goes and he he pries the Silmaril out of Morgoth's crown and yeah. he holds onto it. And then the, the wolf comes along, eats his hand with the Silmaril and like swallows both the Silmaril and his hand whole. And Baron goes back and they're like, Where, where's the Silmaril? He's like, I can assure you that my hand is currently holding the Silmaril. <laughs> so that, they're like, really, where? And he's like, well, I've <laughs> lost my hand. It's gone. It's in the belly of that. Uh, and they're like, ah, uh, technicality. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's in safe hands. I can assure you that. <laughs> Just, just reminds me of that scene of uh, you know the the phone inside the T Rex in Jurassic Park when it's when it's like ringing away. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That's <laughs> funny. But anyways, uh, similar to werewolves, but more notable in Lord of the Rings, we have wargs, as it said in the the Rings wargs. of Power. So these are evil and corrupted <laughs> wolf like creatures used by the orcs. They're mostly found in Ravanion. And they're usually partnered with orcs in the Misty Mountains and they would be their steeds or their mounts. Um, they are incredibly intelligent in- intelligent, and they actually can speak a dreadful language themselves. Not much is known of this language. I think it's just called the Dreadful Language of the Wargs. I think that's the name of it. But Gandalf is one that can actually understand it. Of course he can. Uh, of course he is. Typical Gandalf. Gandalf. But according to Bilgo, Bilgo, Bilbo Baggins, the tongue sounded terrible, according uh, to the Hobbit chapter, Out of the Frying Pan, Into the Fire. So, um, oh, and I just want to say as well, J.R.R. Tolkien derived the word warg from Old English warg, W-E-A-R-G, and Old High German, with warg, and Old Norse, Varg and all of these terms literally mean the same thing and it translates to strangler and choker. So that's kind of cool. I don't know Gross. why I don't know, <laughs> I don't know why that's associated with these wolves. But um moving on to the next creature, a big giant one, Mumica, also known oh. as uh, an oliphant. An oliphant, yes. Um so who calls them oliphants? Do you remember actually? Sam. Yeah, so Sam or the Hobbits. The Hobbits call them Oliphants. They show up in, mm-hmm. in Hobbit folklore. Mumical is how they're referred to by the men of Gondor. Uh, interesting that Oliphants showing up in Hobbit folklore because they're from the east. Uh, they're from Far Harad. And that gives way to the theory that wereworms also exist as Hobbits clearly know about creatures from the east too. And the uh, mm. Bilbo mentions that they're from the east deserts of something. I can't remember that quote. Check it back, folks. <laughs> but um, yeah, so Oliphants are Mumiko. These were enormous elephant-like creatures. We see them in the, the third movie, if anyone's not mm. sure what we're talking about. And these are tamed by the Haradrim in the jungles of Far Harad. Uh, we see them show up in the Pelennor Fields in the book and, and the movie. And they've got huge houses mounted on their backs for the Haradrim. But do you remember, Johnny, when we get our first glimpse of an Oliphant in the book and the film, I believe? Um, yeah, when, when, uh, just before the hobbits get captured by Faramir and his men, uh, when they're, uh, yeah, like that, like in, in the movie, in the, the, in the second, yeah, in the second movie, second one, yeah. um, when, uh, they're, they're cooking their brace of conies, <laughs> uh, Sam's trying to prepare the conies and then, um, uh, they spot the, the, the oliphants and the, the mumicals and, uh, yeah, that whole scene where then. They they linger too long, I believe. Um, yeah, Frodo says, and Faramir shows up and catches them. And it's a it's an interesting trait to note of the Mumical here that they're they're tamed animals and they're being ridden towards battle, but they get flustered and they get a bit agitated very easy when they're being shot at, and yeah, they just kind of <laughs> go out of control and run. I around. get awful agitated too when I get shot at. <laughs> yeah, but I think. Uh, Mumical distressing uh, arrows can't pierce their hide, and I know in the in the film you see like millions of arrows in them, but 
maybe it just doesn't hurt them but the only way you can like mm. um annoy a moon kill is by shooting them in the eyes and that's how they get all flustered and they they run around now they're in the evil section here but i don't think they're inherently evil they're just being tamed by evil men oh, yeah 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 uh, like i think they're just like wild animals but yes you're sure. you're correct uh, it's sam who who talks of them and calls them oliphants and he recites an old hobbit's poem to frodo and gollum in ithilien uh, I'd like to read it for you now, if you don't mind. Oh, fantastic. So the poem, the poem goes like this. Grey as a mouse, big as a house, nose like a snake, I make the earth shake. As I tramp through the grass, trees crack as I pass. With horns in my mouth, I walk in the south, flapping big ears. Beyond count of years, I stump round and round, never lie on the ground, not even to die. Oliphant am I, biggest of all, huge, old and tall. If you'd ever meet me, you wouldn't forget me. If you never do, you won't think I'm true. But old Oliphant am I, and I never lie. Not nice now. Ah, that was cool. Yeah. That was a poem by Tolkien that I could understand. Yeah, yeah. And it rhymes as well, which is kind of unusual. Like, so. Yeah. Some of Tolkien's Very poems good. are so, a little bit more Well, I suppose that's, that's Tolkien's poem written as, like, by a hobbit. perspective of hobbits. So... And they're dumb, so I can understand them. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Poor hobbits. That's what I relate to the hobbits. Also, I have a question uh, for you Ooh. about uh, mumicles. And that is, <laughs> how many tusks does a mumical have? Ah, jeez. Is it specific? Because I thought, yeah. uh, is it? In the in the film, they yeah, can it's have like any amount. Four. No, six. Six. Yeah. Correct. Six. Correct. No, there's a specific number. Same as Ent's <clears throat> toes. Do you Seven. How many toes and inches? Seven. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So there's you know, some. I don't know why, but we had these sort of specific numbers that Tolkien came up with. So ends have seven toes, and Mumical have six, six tusks. Uh, tusks. Yeah. Yeah, because we see in the in the movies they could have they they'll have two big large ones, and then they might. No, have they always like, have six in the movies. Like, oh, they, do they? They, like they'll have two. Yeah, usually two large they have ones. two huge ones, and then two other ones like almost medium large ones. beat them. Yeah. And then they they usually have two like small little ones just okay. like popping out here. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. I so, think I. Well, I think I heard that fact and then afterwards, since then, Went I kind back. of like pay more attention when, I, when I'm watching the movies and I'm kind of going, well, yeah, he's got six too. These are, these are the things that still astonish me with uh, Peter Jackson mm. going back and watching the movies and you hear that fact and then you go and count and you're like, he even got that right. That's amazing. Um, I, I'm not sure if you saw something I put up on Twitter this week and it was just another thing that I never noticed from the movies before, but... That scene, I saw it, yeah. Yeah, that scene of Gandalf going through Minas Tirith, mm. if anyone's wondering. Um, I'd never seen that before. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. I'd never, when, I'd never noticed it, yeah. When Gandalf is like going through all the records in Minas Tirith, they show the passage of time by the candles. There's one camera angle where it zooms over Gandalf's shoulder and the candles are fully lit. And then the next angle, you can see them. They're way down at the bottom. And it's just a nice little uh, note mm. to they're the like, time passing. Yeah, new candles. And then the next scene, they're just... Um, they're about to they're about to burn out right we have um i'm about to burn up myself we have two creatures left in in evil and then we'll get on to the good ones and then we'll have to fly through them oh my god so um <laughs> this next one now i'm pretty sure you wouldn't have heard of so they're called kind of arrow would you have any idea what what kind of creature this is a type of bird no they are a species of white oxen that lived in the fields of rune near the sea of rune and these these creatures were hardier and wilder than any other oxen in Middle Earth. But there is a reason why I want to bring these up because um, uh, legend claims that they were descended from the cattle of Arome, the the huntsman of the Valor, and so they were named the kind of Arrow. But why would they be famous in the Third Age or in, uh, between fans like you and me? Because the kind were often hunted Third. by yeah. Mm-hmm. No, no, sorry. I wasn't going to say they're not the things that like are used to carry grand or anything. No, no. Uh, yeah, I'm curious what the hell those things are. Well, uh, maybe they are. Things. I don't know, but um, there is something interesting about them. I'll, I'll, I'll get into it now. They, they were, they were mm. often hunted by Verondil the hunter, who is an ancestor of the ruling stewards of Gondor, and it was he who cut a horn from one of these beasts and fashioned it into a hunting horn. Uh, and it went on to be called the Great Horn, which came to be carried by the eldest son of the ruling steward from Verondel's time onward. And the last heir to bear the horn was whom? Oh, I thought I was doing it with the Great Horn. <laughs> <laughs> so were you the last one to bear this horn? 
<laughs> uh, sorry, I just dropped this. Really, you were saying who was the last one to bear a horn? The horn, yeah. Are you speaking about the great about Baromir? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was. Right. It was Bar. So Baromir's horn came from a uh, kind of arrow. So these legendary Ooh, creatures who were class. cattle of Aroma, which I just thought was quite cool. So yeah, we we saw it in the movies and in the books. It's broken in two in the battle with the orcs at Amon Hen. So. Yeah. Speaking of the horns, again, mm-hmm. this has nothing to do with the creatures or anything, but just something that I love about the books. I love something that I love about book Barmir, uh, as opposed to movie Barmir, is there is book Barmir is always blasting his horn. He's always <laughs> just like having a little like I was gonna blow my horn right now. <laughs> and like when, when they set out from Rivendell, I remember he like he just like right, we're setting out, we're time to go. And he's like it's a big blast on his horn, and I think I can remember who someone like scolds him for. They're like you know we need to be. You know, we're trying Discreet. to be secretive. This is a, like a, a secret mission. And Barmer's like, hey, I'm not I'm not like some... I think he says he's not like a thief in the night. He will not go out like in the shadows. He's like, mm. I'm going to let my enemies know. I'm coming for them kind of thing. Like, and yeah. it's, it's just like, I can't remember the exact quote, but it's so cool. Like, where he's just kind of going, I'm going to like let everybody know I'm coming for you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> they really worked and, well uh, as a class. team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he was there like, just like, hey, time was like, we have the advantage of secrecy. Barber's like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Horn of Gondor. So, moving on to our very last creature. And this creature is called Krebine. So, Johnny, what kind of yeah, creatures okay. are these? And what what's so what was the name of the last one? The last thing that you said was like... Uh, kind like of Kain. arrow. Kine. Kine. When you say kine, I was like, oh, is that a bird? Because I was thinking of like Krebine. Krebine. I was like, okay, it's got a similar sounding... Similar vibe. Name. Like, you know, it starts with, starts with a C and it ends with an Ein. Mm-hmm. So, um, Kine, Krebine... So Krebine of Dunland are the main ones that we hear about and mm-hmm. that we see in the movies as well. And they are, yeah, they're birds. They are kind of like ravens, I suppose. They're kind of like black birds yeah, that exactly. are very often used as spies by Saruman. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and that's it. They'd be kind of like, they just go around finding stuff out and uh, reporting back to Saruman. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much all we know about them. They're, they're birds of crow kind, it says, and they're native to both Dunland and the Fangorn Forest. And they were likely corrupted by Saruman. Again, I don't think these were inherently evil creatures. They were just used by Saruman for or Saruman for evil deeds. Um, Aragorn notably notably says in the Fellowship of the Ring, "A knife in the dark." Quote: Not all the birds are to be trusted. So there you go. Mm. And that and in the movie we see Legolas saying, "Crabon of Dunland." Yeah. And uh, when he spots it, when G- Gilby's like, "Not nothing. It's a whiff of cloud. It's a whiff of cloud." Yes. Yeah. Have you seen, um, did you happen to see Gimli in the latest trailer of Indiana Jones? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Old John, John Reese. Excited yeah. to have him back. Right, so let's mm. move swiftly on for good creatures or creatures that are just used for good. So the first one I'm going to mention here, you might not know of this either, the Karinki. So can you guess what these animals are? Just by uh, the sound of them. <laughs> Karinki wink. Um, <laughs> Karinki. Hmm. I've no idea. I've no idea what, what, what a Karinki is. You don't want it's to. It's probably funny now. I, I can't. I, I'm, I'm sorry. My, my mind is. I'm just thinking of like a slinky now. I can't think of it. <laughs> a Karinki. Um, I've no idea. No. Right. So I mean, just because you, the last thing you guessed was birds, these are birds, and these are birds that are uh. native to Numenor. The Karinki were said to be no bigger than wrens, with bright scarlet feathers and piping voices so high that they could hardly even be heard of. Of it by men and that's pretty much all mm. we know of the crinky but johnny what other birds are important in middle earth um the eagles mm-hmm. so what do we know about the eagles all oh, right i was wondering if you wanted more oh well, uh, yeah. what do we know about the eagles the eagles are the messengers of manway yes very good um they are very important creatures they are very highly intelligent beings they're mm-hmm. not just like some like maybe the crebine are just they just go out and they fly around they see what's going on they report back the the eagles like have their own like comings and going they have their own like I don't know they have their own backstory going on they're just they're not really they don't really care about like you know that, that's why lots of, you know the whole thing you can go back and listen to one of our first ever episodes which is on why the eagles didn't take the ring to 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 Mordor but like they just like they were just doing their own thing yeah. and they were like again it's like saying why didn't the eagles well why didn't the you know dwarves why they'd be like hey dwarves go and do this and the dwarves like yeah. feck off we're doing our own thing here so um 
the Eagles were very intelligent. They were, um, and then we do see them a few times uh, in the Lord of the Rings. We see them when they, they always just come in and swoop in and save the day. Yeah. Uh, so like we the see Avengers. them in the Hobbit when they, yeah, we see them in the Hobbit when they come in and save the day and they kind of save everyone um, when they're being attacked by the the wargs and the, the, the wargs. orcs. And then we also see them in, uh, well, we see them saving, we see Gwai here saving Gandalf, of course, mm-hmm. uh, from the pinnacle of Orthanc. We see them in the battle at the Black Gate, where they come in and they kind of start fighting in the skies against uh, the, the fell beasts. Mm-hmm. And we also see them saving Frodo and Sam uh, at the Cracks of Doom. Yeah, very good. That's, yeah, you summed up all the most notable events that they turned up. Um, so like you said they're they're sentient creatures and they're actually capable of speech themselves and they often helped men elves and wizards um, they were sent from Valinor by Manwe to Middle Earth to keep an eye on the exiled Noldor and their foe was the evil Vala Morgoth and you already mentioned one there you, you said a name so I just want to ask you um, can you tell me any of the great eagles names you, you got one Thorondor Oh, well done. Well done. So, Thorondor, what was the first one you mentioned as well? Uh, Gwai here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And there's probably two other mentions, but I forgot to write down the the fourth guy. I think I'd be... He was just a friend. I'd be struggling out. Oh, yeah, you know. (laughs) No, I'm I'm glad you got Thorondor. That's a good one. Thorondor was the Lord of Eagles. And it it said Mm. that... It said that Thorondor had a wingspan of 30 fathoms. Now, do you know what a fathom is? Because I had to Google I it. I can't even fathom it. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't fathom it either. I had to look up what a fathom was. And it's it's a, it's roughly is it like, six feet. It's like a hectare or something. <laughs> six feet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, a hectare, that's a, that'd be huge. Um, and also, Thoron is... Oh, Thoron. Uh, Th- Thoron is the Quenya and Sindarin name for eagle. Which, there you go. No, the, that's just... That's the name for Elrond. <laughs> Thoron. <laughs> yeah. The Rondo. <laughs> Also, yeah. Thorin Oakenshield, but no, that's a different spelling. That'd be Thorin with an I, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so, hang on, you said 30 uh, fathoms, and a fathom is six feet. Yeah. So, if you think of a tall man, and you get 30 tall men to stand, like, to lie down all yeah. together, that's, uh, that's the wingspan of, uh, um, of him. Wow, that's pretty good. Wow, wow, wow. Uh, wow. So, yeah. yeah that's, a, that's a big bird. You also, you also <laughs> mentioned uh, Gwai here who during the War of the Rings, so during the Third Age or during the time of the Lord of the Rings movies, he was the greatest and fastest eagle. And like you said, he was the one that rescued Gandalf at Orthanc. And I think he, I think he was just good buddies with Gandalf. Um, so hmm. you often see him popping up. Busy and, mates. Yeah, and his brother was Landreval. And Landreval is probably most noticeably um, known for helping Gwaihir rescue Beren and Luthien from Angband. And there was another eagle. Mm. I didn't write his name down because I kind of forgot, but he was just like friends of Gwaihir and Landreval, but pff, who cares? What did he, Hanging out. What did yeah. he do? And again, like like you just mentioned, Johnny, uh, we have an episode on the eagle. So if you want to learn more, go check that out. Go to the bottom of our mm. archives. And we're doing a lot of plugging in this episode, which I like. So that is the eagles. Can you give me another bird that is um, that is associated in Middle Earth for the good? I'm running low on birds. Uh, <laughs> flamingos? <laughs> How did you know? The flamingos of Dol Goldor. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, hang on. Other birds. Small birds. birds uh, like small little birds. Uh, just like any of those friends of Radagast. Like just those little... Tits. I just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All those tits that surrounded Radagast. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I can't think of. Okay, I'll I'll I'll, I'll give you. Th- th- I'm you thinking of two more, them. and I, once I say them, you might have something to say about them. So we have the Ravens right. of oh, Erebor. Mm. Mm. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I'll get uh, I'll get into it. So the Ravens, these were large blackbirds associated usually with ill news of death, and they were known for their harsh voices. But these were intelligent ravens of Ravenhill, which is. Uh, located near Erebor and they could live to a great age and some could even speak Westron and they were very Jesus. they were friendly with the dwarves as well the dwarves of Erebor that was that that is mm. <laughs> so Kark was the name of one of these birds and his son Roach was the leader of the ravens of Erebor in the third age um, this is when Thorin and company reclaimed the mountain from Smog, and 
uh, Roach actually aided the dwarves in their quest. He was an old, old raven who was going blind. He was having difficulty flying as well. And it's even said that he sported a bald spot on top of his head. Um, <laughs> and just an interesting well, thing to note as well about ravens. When, when Pippin became the one of the guards of the Citadel, his new garments included a high crowned helm with small raven wings on either side. So I thought that was pretty cool. And that's something I'm going to have okay. to go back and check in Peter Jackson's uh, yeah. movie and see. Mm. Is it accurate? I'm sure it is. Um, so Johnny another bird that pops up is the thrush and I'm not talking about the, the itchiness on your private parts what can you tell me about the, the thrush or where do we, we hear is of it this? to do with Erebor as well mm-hmm. yeah so the thrush um, well we I, we see it in the movie as well that he's like tapping on the on the wall of uh, where, the, where the, the the secret door is the secret entrance yeah. into Erebor where the they climb up and they're like waiting for the the last light of um of Durin's day, and then there's like um we see that scene with the thrush like trying to open a I don't know a snail nut of some kind yeah and he's, is it a snail or yeah a, and he's like ba- banging it like with his head off the wall and then you can you you go inside into Erebor and you can hear that little noise like uh, banging away I think it maybe disturbs Smaug for a moment as well in the yeah movie. in the movie yeah I think I think that happens but um I can't remember too much about from that well. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Actually, do you know what? It's at the it's, 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 it's they're the, just like birds that are very commonly like they're just commonly found like living around the mountain. Or, yeah, no, but I was uh, just going to talk about where you said um, it disturbs smog. It's actually the end of the very first film that you see the thrush flying from like near where the hobbits are sorry Bilbo and the dwarves are and he goes all the way to the lonely mountain and he picks up like a nut or something and he's banging it against the thing and that's when you see Smog's eye open for the first time it's not the same thrush yeah. well it might be the same thrush but it's not the same scene where in the second movie they eventually get to the lonely mountain and the thrush is banging it away but yeah that that that's like one of the most important um things about the thrush on thor's map was 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 there uh was there some sort of a prophecy about yeah the, like yeah yeah, yeah. so the so on on the map that thor has the moon letters instructions said to quote stand by the gray stone when the thrush knocks on Durin's day mm. to see the magic hole and the magic hole is revealed uh thorn stated that this thrush was actually a member of an ancient breed long lived and magical so yeah it is actually part of the prophecy of getting into yeah, the mountain yeah yeah that, that 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 makes sense. Yeah. But another cool thing about thrushes is that the men of Lake Town and Dale could actually understand the language of the thrushes, and some mm. thrushes could understand the common tongue as well. So fortunately, the thrush on the mountain, the one that's like you know banging away, like the prophecy says, he uh, he was one of the thrushes that could understand the common tongue, and he was able to understand Bilbo's account of his talk with smog and hear about the bare patch on the dragon's breast so this thrush heard this conversation and oh my god <laughs> and on the night when smog attacked uh Esgaroth, the thrush spoke to bard and he revealed the vulnerable part of the monster so he went up and spoke to bard's ear and that was why bard was able to pierce the dragon with his arrow with his knowledge so there you go it's all thanks to a little tiny bird the thrush that smog was defeated well done the thrush yeah so um only uh one or two creatures left we have we've already mm-hmm. discussed this creature a little bit um huan so huan yeah we, we've already mentioned him uh he was a friend of baron and luthien he was a Rome's hound and also known as the hound of valinor and he was blessed with mm-hmm. immortality large size and tirelessness he never really slept at all and he was mm-hmm. he was told that he was allowed to speak three times before he died, or that was his like prophecy, I suppose. Um, yeah, it was also prophesized that he could not be killed unless it was by the greatest wolf that ever lived, and in this case, it was a werewolf. So Huan was originally gifted to Caligorm, who was one of the sons of Feanor. But when Huan came into contact with Luthien, he felt love and pity, and ultimately helped Luthien escape her captivity from the sons of Feanor. Um, and he journeyed side by side with Baron and Luthien for their quest of a Silmaril. So I just have written down here the the three times he spoke 
I don't really expect you to cool. remember any of them. Do you remember? No, no. I mean, I could try and force myself to remember, but I'd yeah. rather you just give it, give them to us. Right. So the first time is when he told Luthien of a way to escape. So that's uh, the first time he spoke. It must be kind of bizarre as well. You have this hound with you the whole time, and then suddenly it's just like, "We should take this way." And you're like, "Holy shit!" Yeah. <laughs> maybe we should. Maybe the only time he's maybe the only time he spoke, he was like, "Raggy." <laughs> 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 and they're like that's great who are thanks for your advice <laughs> yeah thanks <laughs> can you shut that dog up <laughs> so the second time Huan spoke he told Beren and Luthien of his plan to gain entrance into Angband bringing them the skin of the werewolf Draguloin and the bat skin of Sauron's messenger as previously mentioned Thurungwithil so this was going to be their disguises to get in and the mm. last time he spoke was after being mortally wounded by um, the aforementioned Karkaroth he wished Baron and Luthien farewell and died with Baron's palm upon his head so that's quite sad um, but the coolest thing about Huon is he was the one he actually defeated Sauron in hand to hand well paw to paw combat whilst he was disguised as a werewolf we, we just talked about before Sauron was disguised as a werewolf and do you remember the reason why Sauron turned into a werewolf I do I do because he was so prideful that he he knew about the prophecy that Huan could only be defeated by the greatest werewolf. And he was like, well, I mean, if I just turn myself into a werewolf, yeah. then surely I'll be the greatest werewolf to ever be on Middle Earth. So, uh, cocky. He got a, yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. So he was just cocky. Like, I mean, it's like me meeting a pilot and just the pilot being like, yeah, so um, have you ever flown a plane? And I'm like, no, but I reckon if I did, I'd probably be the best in the world. Whatever, yeah. You know, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, so it's just really, yeah, really cocky. He had that but, entrepreneurial um, spirit, I suppose. Spirit <laughs> of a Meyer. And he was like, you know, I'm just going to be the best at whatever I put my mind to. But no, unfortunately, it wasn't Sauron. He had to escape. And like we said, it was Karkaroth that ultimately kills Huan. And I think Huan also kills Karkaroth. It's kind of like one of those double knockout th- situations there. Well, it was like... Rocky finish situation. Yeah. Like, uh, the both get they both have the, the, yeah, yeah, they both get like, the, the movie just finishes with both of them like getting the killer blow. <laughs> yeah. like, who's who's going to win? Yeah. So by this account, that would suggest that Karkaroth is the greatest werewolf of all time. Or the, great, the, the greatest wolf. The, the sure. greatest wolf that ever lived. So um, that is Huan. Now the next uh, creature we will get onto is another creature of Arom- Arome's. He did not only have the greatest hound that ever lived, but he also had the greatest steed. His steed was named Nahar. So Nahar was the horse of Arome, and his coat was said to be white under the sun, but to shimmer in silver in the night, and his feet were shod in gold. So that's kind of cool. Um, and we know of the the famous darkening of Valinor, when basically Ungoliant and Morgoth... Uh, destroyed the trees of Valinor and then the the whole place went into a terrible terrible darkness Um, but it is said that the sparks struck from the hooves of Nahar were the first light that returned to Valinor so there you go seems like a a pretty cool horse so um, speaking of horses uh, we can talk about some of the other great horses do you remember do you happen to remember the name of the the Rohirrim race of horses the one that Gandalf has it's like a specific name Gandalf goes this the, this is one of the the Rohiric no type of no. horse uh, begins oh, begin, um, begins with an M uh, I think I was just reading about these the other day um, feck uh, I can't think of it no so the the great oh the the, the Myris the Maris yeah or how, the Maris Maris yeah it's like M A E M E A or A S Maris. Yeah, yeah. So Maris. So, yeah, I've close. Enough. Yeah, you're pretty bang on. This um this is literally Rohiric for race of exceptional horses. Uh they would bear no Ooh. man but the kings or princes of the mark, with an obvious exception to Gandalf. Their lifespan were as their lifespan was as long as men. So Johnny, can you name any of the Maris? Well, Shadowfax. Yeah, Shadowfax, given to Gandalf by Theoden, and he was of grey colour, which is kind of different to Peter Jackson's. But any other ones? Hmm. I would expect you to get um, at least one more. Uh, Asphaloth? No. 
These are like Rohirrim, um, Rohiric. Yeah, horses, yeah, okay, fair enough. Are they the ones that um, uh, Aemir mentions? No. Half, 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 what does he say? Uh, Hassafel. You, Hassafel. Yeah, it's, 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 it's something like that. Like, uh, he says Hassafel, yeah. Just like, that's what Aemir says. says he, but that's not one he, of them. He calls two, but he calls two of them over. Mm. Yeah, no, but this, these are Hassafel. only to be ridden by kings and princes. So that should be a, uh, an obvious okay. hint. Uh, Brego. <laughs> no. Who's the king of Rohan? Was Brego... No, but I'm saying Brego was Theodred's horse. Mm-hmm. And so... And Theodred was the prince. Okay, not, so, anyway, not Brego. Right, okay. No, okay, right. Uh, so you're you're looking for um, Theoden's horse. Mm-hmm. Who's Theoden's horse? I don't know. Oh, you do. Do you not? I, I'm going blank again. Right. I can't think Snowman of is Theoden's horse. Snowman. Yeah. So this was... I wouldn't have got that. Oh, right. Okay. So this was Theoden's steed and he was eventually slain by the Witch King at the Pelennor Fields by a dart. Uh, and another mm. another one to mention would be Felleroth, which was the, the steed of Earl the Young, the first king of Rohan. And this was the the first of the descendants of the Meras. So he was like the, the father of the Meras. Um, other named horses in Tolkien's writing include, you just mentioned Brago, which is Aragorn's. We have Arok, which is Hurin's. We have Arod, which is the one that Legolas and Gimli ride. Asphaloth, which is, who who owns Asphaloth? Um, this is a trick question. Yeah, I know, because I was going to say Arwen, but it's Arwen in the movie. Yeah. It's um, Glorfindel. Exactly. Glorfindel's horse, but obviously in Peter Jackson's movie, he swaps out Glorfindel for Arwen to give her some more screen time. And that is Arwen's horse. We also have Firefoot, which is the horse of Eomer. Uh, Hasufel, who you just mentioned there, which is ridden by Aragorn, gifted by Eomer. And there's others as well, but I didn't want to go into the big long list. What was the name of, what was the, name of the one that you said was ridden by uh, Legolas and Gimli? Um, Arad. Hasufel. Arod. Those are the two names yeah. that uh, Aimer shouts out yeah, in the movie. I can't do the whistle. But yeah, yeah, yeah. that's pretty yeah. cool. So finally, we're on to our last creature. And these oh. are the ponies. So Johnny, give me some ponies names. Yeah. Do you know any ponies names? Comet, Cupid, <laughs> and uh, Donner and Blitz. <laughs> exactly, uh, yeah. Ponies names. Well, we got, we got Bill the Pony. Bill the Pony, yeah. So who owns Bill the Pony? Or does anyone own Bill the Pony? Who's Bill? Bill the Pony owns you. Um, <laughs> Bill the Pony, Bill the Pony rides you. Was ri- wasn't he originally owned by Bill Fernie? Yes. Uh, yeah, I think and so. Then, yeah. And then Bill Fernie sells him to the um, to the buys, uh, to the Fellowship for like, uh, well, sorry, to Aragorn and the, and the Hobbits. He sells him to them for like three or four times his worth or something because he's just a real dick. And, uh, and they... But they 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 buy him anyway. They they buy him off off Bill Fernie, and uh, and then yeah, and then he has this nice relationship with Sam, and I don't know too much more about him. But yeah, I remember that they 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 paid like three or four times his worth to buy him. Yeah, yeah, that's he was such a good. That's boy. definitely right. But for some reason, I have here it, that Bill is bought by Barleyman Butterer in Bree for Frodo and his companion. So I think he's the one that makes the exchange. Oh, maybe he does it. No, maybe he does it to make up for like the massive like, uh, screw up. That okay, he right. That, that's what it is. And, and yeah, you mentioned there he I becomes think, yeah. besties with Sam and it's lovely because mm-hmm. everyone kind of hates the scene where Bill has to be sent away at the, at the doors of Durin. <laughs> had to focus on that. Well done. Um, yeah. <laughs> but at the end of Return of the King, Sam and Bill are actually reunited once again. Do you remember any other names of heart or of ponies? Um, got one fatty Bulger's pony. Mm, no, but you got the no na- fatty was. You got the oh, name, fa- right? fatty lumpkin. Fatty lumpkin was, and whose pony did this belong to? Ring a ding dillo. Ah, okay, right. So uh, Bombadil, Tom Bombadil's um, pony. Yeah, fatty lumpkin. Fatty lumpkin was the name of Tom Bombadil. So other ones we have is Strider, which was Frodo's pony after, obviously taken after Aragorn's nickname. And this is the pony that he rides from Minas Tirith back to the Shire at the end of Return of the King. And then eventually from the Shire to the Grey Havens when he sets off to Valinor. And lastly, we have Stiba or Stiba. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but this is Mary's pony that is lent by Theoden. 
and interesting to note here that stiva or stiva is actually old English for the word stubby. So there you have it. That's um, that's mm. uh, that's all the creatures. Now, obviously, I didn't want to get into every single creature in the Lord of the Rings. Like I didn't <laughs> talk about orcs, trolls, hobbits, uh, all that kind of stuff because you know we have sure. talked about a lot of them before in in other episodes. And yeah. If anyone wants to hear about a lot, a lot of those evil creatures, go back and check out the orcs episode as well. That's a that's a really good one where we talk yeah, about all those. A good one. But I'd like to have mm-hmm. a special mention for some of the following: um, Ents, Balrogs. Ettins, Nazgul, Undead, Meyer, uh, Bayorn, and I didn't go through all of these because, you know, so, some obvious reasons. Some of them aren't really creatures, some of them are Meyer, some of them are like spirits, some of them are just like r- more of a race than creatures themselves. Like I could say men and elves, but like, you know. Or like people like Bayorn are just one individual. Exactly. Bay- yeah, and he Bayorn is interesting because he comes from skin changers, I think is what they call them, is the race. And he yeah. says he's he's the last of the skin changers. So, yeah, sure. yeah we we might actually talk about Bayorn separately in, mm. in his own episode. But can you actually think of any other creatures or have I, have I covered most of them, do you think? I think you've exhausted the list there now of all the creatures. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, that was good. That was good. I can't... Uh... No, off the top of my head, no. But I mean, there could be some others that might come to me in a while, but uh, not really. Uh, we did the spiders. We did, um, yeah, yeah. We did pretty much everything. Did pretty we much can. everything. Well are there any sort of famous fish? We had the turtle fish, species? which are Tolkien or sorry, Hobbit legends. But uh, I don't know. But what about that giant fish that drags Deagle underwater when he goes fishing? <laughs> yeah. I, wonder what, I, wonder what, I wonder what his deal was. He was a salmon, <laughs> a river salmon. <laughs> yeah. Also, do you know in the Hobbit movie? Uh, which one? I think it's the second one when Bil- when they're in Mirkwood in the forest and Bilbo's off on his own. The others are all being captured by the spiders and he has like a little fight with this like big giant insect thing. It's kind of similar to the insects in Peter Jackson's King Kong movie. And I don't know oh, where right. that came from or what that's supposed to be. But if anybody knows, mm. please um, drop us a comment and let us also, know. Also, uh, rabbits. Oh, the rabbits of Ross Bottom or something. Fangorn. Yeah, but they call he calls them like Ross Bottom fa- rabbits or something, doesn't he? I can't remember that now, but uh, maybe you're on something. I do remember he goes. Uh, somebody goes. You cannot outrun them. Those wargs are from Dunland or they're from wherever. And he goes. Well, these rabbits are from Ross Bottom or <laughs> something like that. And he just like <laughs> flies off. Yeah, I don't know what those are. Um, again, probably a, an uh, invention by Peter Jackson. Oh, and Sebastian the Badger. Oh, Sebastian. <laughs> Sebastian yeah <laughs> um, yeah so uh, but apart from those yeah um, good job nice list I was um, learned quite a few things mm, yeah well very good. and I've been refreshed on my memory and some other things as well I think um, yeah I think like you said we've exhausted the list but yeah um, that is one of the meras unless my eyes are cheated by some spell shadow fact the lord of all horses and has been my friend for many dangers That's all we have time for today on the Council of Elrond. Uh, please let us know if there's any other creatures that we missed out on and uh, or if, you know, you want to add some information there or if you want to find out some information. So thank you so much for listening. Mm. If you want to leave us a comment, you can do so on YouTube or you can tweet us at melon underscore heads. All of our social media links are in the podcast info section. And again, if you'd like to support myself and Johnny with these podcasts, you can sign up to our Patreon where you'll get bonus discussions there. I'd like to say that this week we've uploaded the guitar instrumental that you're hearing right about now um, in the background. And that is available for download on Patreon. So thank you to all, to all of our patrons and a special thank you to Jack Knightley. And until next week, guys, Namarie. See you guys. <laughs>